All right, everyone, again, welcome to Dental CE Academy. Our course this evening is the benefits of xylitol in oral health prevention strategies and beyond. I am the Chief Education Officer here at Dental CE Academy. I'm also a public health dentist. I was the Chief for the Office of Oral Health for Maricopa County's Public Health Department, and I used xylitol products um, during our treatment of our patients, whether they were in schools or we also had a maternal oral health program that I used xylitol, and we'll be talking about that this evening as well. This course this evening is sponsored by IOTech International, and I am the Chief Education Officer. Again, I have not received an honorarium. I declare no financial affiliation with IOTech International, and no corporate entity has influenced the content of this presentation. For any questions, you can reach us through our website. Here is the agenda. Five to six, I will be speaking for one hour of CE credit. Our sponsor this evening will speak afterwards. This is Jason Garris. He's the Vice President of Global Sales for IOTech International, and he's going to be talking about IOTech's molecular iodine which um, they do have a new product that includes xylitol and the synergistic effects. I'll be discussing that chemistry towards the end. This is not required for CE credit. You can log off at six and be redirected to the quiz, or if you want to learn about xylitol and molecular iodine and uh, the synergistic qualities, I would encourage you to do so because it is highly, highly efficacious, probably the most efficacious of any synergistic effect we have out there for oral health products. And I don't say that lightly, I've seen the studies. Okay, CE credit instructions. Um, you can log out again at six or you can stay on a few minutes, log out anytime you want to after six o'clock. You'll be taken to a screen to complete the quiz. At 6.35, we'll email the quiz to everybody that is in attendance. And 80% is the passing score. You have seven days to complete and you have unlimited attempts, all right? If you have any questions, you can reach out to us through our website. Okay, if anybody has any questions about how to get CE credit, now is the time to ask. And if you need the handout, please tap on that green banner at the top of the screen. And it's minus 33 degrees in Calgary. So let's um, give it up for Dr. Ma for being here this evening. <laughs> I don't miss those temperatures, okay? I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm here in Phoenix for a reason. Okay, let's go ahead and get started, everyone. Feel free to ask me questions about xylitol. I know quite a bit about it. I've been teaching this course now for over 10 years, and I've used xylitol extensively in my clinical practice, both pediatric as well as older adults. So we're going to discuss xylitol's mechanism of action, background information concerning its chemical properties, as well as uses beyond oral health. There are the learning objectives. They're in your handout. If you have the handout, you can just follow along. It's the exact copy of my presentation. We are recording this. So for those of you watching the recording later, just scroll down below the video player and number two is the handout, number three is your quiz. Okay, xylitol has been researched since the 1970s as an effective strategy for dental caries prevention. And the history is very interesting. The US uh, Food and Drug Administration in 1963 endorsed xylitol for special dietary purposes. And the World Health Organization in 1993 the National Institutes of Health, the Hawaii Dental Hygienist Association, as well as Arizona Dental Hygienist Association, which I know very well here, and the New York Dental Hygienist Associations that all endorsed xylitol. And xylitol's unique properties really stem from its chemical structure because the mole molecule of xylitol contains five carbon atoms and five hydroxyl groups. That's the oxygen, hydrogen, bond and that makes it a pentatol. In comparison, most natural sweeteners, other natural sweeteners contain six carbon atoms and six hydrox hydroxyl groups. That's an important distinction as we talk about xylitol this evening because this five carbon structure is the key reason why many carigenic bacteria 
cannot metabolize xylitol. There are the xylitol's um, properties right there for you. And basically it's important to understand it is soluble in water. Its molar mass is very similar to that of sucrose, which we would used to call table sugar. I don't think we call it table sugar anymore. So if you picked up a pound of xylitol crystals, it would feel very similar and probably look very similar to that of sucrose. Now, xylitol is categorized as a sugar alcohol, also known as a polyol or a polyalcohol used as a sweetener. And that ending, the ITOL, just means that it is a sugar alcohol. It has a 100-year history, and it gets its name from xylose, which means wood, and xylene, which means hardwood. And it's widely approved for use in food around the world extensively, as you know, in pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, oral hygiene products, and toiletries. In 1993, the World Health Organization's Joint Expert Committee on Food Additives allocated xylitol as an acceptable daily intake of, quote, not specified, placing it in the safest category for a food ingredient. And if you've had OCHEM, organic chemistry, you remember the ball and stick models. And here we go. For xylitol, we have five carbons, 12 hydrogens, and five oxygens. So black, white, and red. And again, those hydroxyl groups that you see there, the red and white. What is a sugar alcohol? Well, it gets its name because of its molecular structure. It's a hybrid between a sugar mo molecule and an alcohol molecule. And sugar alcohols are very structurally similar to uh, sugar to sucrose or table sugar, but they're either poorly digested, and we'll talk about the case of maltitol, or they're poorly metabolized as the case of erythritol. These five hydroxyl groups, again, instead of six, make it poorly metabolized by bacteria. So when we look at the sucrose molecule, again, this would be the white sugar that you would bake with. Uh, you see what, a glucose ring on the left and a fructose ring on the right, and those oxygens are red, okay, and carbons are purple, and notice the fructose ring, and keep, hold, keep this in your memory bank here, the five carbons in that fructose molecule. Xylitol's history in OCHEM goes all the way back to 1890s when French and German researchers developed it by using the sodium amalgam reduction of dexylose or wood sugar. And we know that sodium is unstable. So we want to, um, in this case, use an alloy and they used an alloy of mercury and sodium and used it as a powerful reducing agent, making it safer to handle than sodium by itself. Originally, xylitol was a syrupy impure mixture and it contained other sugar alcohols. So if you know anything about maple sugar, I see we have a few people here from Pennsylvania and I grew up with maple trees and maple sugar and maple candy and maple syrup. If you tap those trees for the syrup, that syrup is not pure. It's going to contain other types of sugars. And that is the case for xylitol here. And we'll see that birch trees were used in the same process. In the 1930s, a purification process took place and during World War II it was developed into its crystalline form from pure D xylose. We know that Native Americans recognized the antibacterial properties of birch trees. They fabricated teething rattles for their children. Um, they fabricated tooth cleaning sticks as well. Europeans have used xylitol for decades for baking, cooking, and beverage sweeteners since World War II. And during World War II, we had a sugar shortage that we'll talk about. And that sugar shortage really launched quite a bit of the research that uh, we see today. Now, during the 1950s, for instance, it was discovered that xylitol could prevent ear infections in children. And it's been FDA approved since 1963. So here's a timeline for you, a historical timeline for you of xylitol. 
And again, in the 1800s, Native Americans used birch wood to maintain oral hygiene. In 1900, it was used as a diabetic sugar substitute. In 1940s, Europeans began to use xylitol because of the sugar shortage here during World War II. Doctors noticed in the 1950s that children who consumed xylitol had fewer ear infections. In 1963, the FDA approved xylitol for special dietary uses, as we said. In the 1960s and 70s, researchers explored the effects of xylitol with amazing results. At an NIH symposium in 2001, xylitol's benefits were shown scientifically significant by evidence-based evaluation. And in 2001, the US military adopted xylitol for its dental prevention programs. In 2008, the Arizona and H Hawaiian Dental Hygienist Association adopted xylitol and endorsed it for its preventive method for patients and uh, therapeutic benefits. Now, scientists did not realize the biologic properties of xylitol until researchers were forced to exploit its insulin-independent nature following World War II. Front runners in these developments were Japan, Germany, and the former Soviet Union. And in Japan, for instance, xylitol was used to resuscitate patients from diabetic coma. Sugar rationing occurred, occurred during World War II. Um, it was the very first food to be rationed in the U.S. in spring of 1942, and it followed the bombing of Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. And at that time, the U.S. cut off imports from the Philippines and cargo ships from Hawaii were diverted. Why? Because Hawaii happened to be a very large exporter of sugarcane. So the U.S. therefore was a large exporter of sugarcane to the U to Europe and abroad. And because we had the uh, uh, cargo ships diverted, our sugar supply was reduced by more than one third. So the U.S. was concerned about hoarding of sugar. Think of toilet paper back at the beginning of the pandemic. Hoarding of sugar, skyrocketing process, uh, prices. Think of how much of an increase in price we saw in our PPE, for instance, right? Shortages can lead to all of these things. And so the U.S. issued at that time the stamps through the Office of Price Administration, 123 million copies of these war ration books that contained these little stamps that you had to turn in to be able to legally purchase sugar. So sugar could not be purchased legally in the U.S. without these stamps until the end of World War II, which was about 1947. So when you look at this poster here, this is a poster that you would have seen in any typical grocery store back in the day. And you see sugar was rationed to two pounds um, England, two pounds per month, France, one pound, one ounce, and sugar, 11 ounces. And this was per person per month. Two pounds to me is a lot of sugar. I don't think I even eat a half a cup. This is what I thought. But if you think about hidden sugars, um, if you like an occasional mocha latte, whatever, I guess it could have back then. And, and at that time, food wasn't as heavily processed as it is now. And again, for those of you that just joined us live, be sure you have the handout. You can tap on the green banner at the top of the screen and review the instructions that we have here in the chat area. So this was an article in the um, Daily Town Talk, the newspaper, 1942, in Alexandria, Louisiana. I know it well. And this was sugar stamps to be required, each individual to be allowed 12 ounces each week. So because of that sugar shortage, researchers across Europe and here 
had to look for alternative sweeteners. And these were the war ration books with the stamps that had to be turned in to purchase sugar. Now, xylitol remained mostly as a research chemical until this war associated sugar shortage in some of the countries like Finland, for instance, forced these engineers and these chemists to search for alternative sweeteners. Finland took a beating during World War II, right? all of the European countries did, but Finland being close to Russia, et cetera. Uh, such substances were present, for example, in hardwood and researchers and engineers at the former Finnish candy company succeeded in developing an industrial procedure for the small scale production of xylitol. And production then was temporarily halted once World War II ended and the sugar shortage subsided. And again, if any of you have any questions, let us know. Now, xylitol has been used since the early 1960s in infusion therapy for post-operative burn and shock patients, also in the diet of patients with diabetes, and as a sweetener in products that aim to improve oral health. Dental benefits of xylitol first were suggested from these very famous studies called the Turku sugar studies. And these were the first xylitol studies using humans, demonstrating the relationship between dental plaque and xylitol, as well as the safety of xylitol for human consumption. These candies were candies that were produced because of the sugar shortage. They're xylitol candies produced in Finland. They're called Sisu, S-I-S-U, named after the Finnish people, and they stand for courage, perseverance, and bravery. Now, 1975, the Finnish company, Finnish candy company, began the first truly large-scale production of xylitol in Kotka. That was a small town in southern Finland. Other countries jumped in. Switzerland, Russia, Japan also began xylitol production for use in diabetic patients and IV infusion. And the first chewing gum with xylitol was produced by Finland and dental uses um, oral health uses in 1975. So Finland had discovered through those Turku studies, sugar studies, that xylitol was beneficial to reduce the incident of decay. And so they began incorporating it in pharmaceuticals, chewing gum, et cetera. The US followed shortly thereafter. Now sugar alcohol is commonly found in foods Sorbitol, mannitol, maltitol, xylitol, erythritol, isomalt, hydrogenated starch hydrolysis. Sugar alcohols come from plant products, fruits, berries. It's the carbohydrate in these plant products, the xylose unit, which is then altered through a chemical process. Sugar alcohols are commonly found in food products that are labeled sugar-free. These can include hard candies, cookies, chewing gum, beverages. Recently, they've become very popular, incorporated in health foods. And these products that you see here are not an endorsement, just a general idea of some of the xylitol products that are out there. And again, um, if you stay on for a few minutes after this CE presentation, Iotech International is going to be speaking about molecular iodine in which they have used uh, xylitol and a synergistic effect that occurs by that combination. So hopefully if you can stay on for a few minutes, not required again, but you're going to learn about uh, that product as well. So here we go. Um, white strips, x you may have heard of, which is a sinus nasal spray that includes xylitol, certainly sugar-free jams, mints, toothpaste, children's vitamins, Nicorit gum. This is another example of ice cubes, which contain xylitol as well. Sugar alcohol has grown in popularity as a sugar replacement in foods like protein bars because they contain fewer calories. They minimally impact insulin levels. They're safe for those with diabetes and they're better for your oral health. So if you go into any of the big box 
Whole Foods, et cetera, you're going to see almost an entire aisle devoted to what? Protein bars, fiber bars. Look at the label. We're going to talk about the sugar alcohols that you may find in those. Many of the sugar alcohols are also considered prebiotics. So a lot of talk now about probiotics. That's another course that I teach. I've been teaching it for well over 10 years. Prebiotics are now being added to probiotics because there is supposedly some synergy there. Why? Because probiotics are basically bacteria, uh, yeast, et cetera. They're supposed to enhance the gut microbiome, right? And prebiotics are the food, the substrate for those probiotics. So this is um, sugar alcohol considered prebiotics. Again, so xylitol is a prebiotic. And if you look at some of the probiotics out there now, you'll see contains a prebiotic. Look very carefully at the ingredients because sometimes what they'll do is they'll incorporate xylitol in the capsule of that probiotic and call it a prebiotic, which um, again, probiotics are not regulated by the FDA. They are, um, they cannot make claims. And again, that's something we talk about in the probiotics course. But note, the sugar alcohols are prebiotics. They're thought to be uh, food substrate for the probiotics. So what are they exactly? Non-digestible food ingredient that promotes the growth of beneficial microorganisms in the intestines. So um, sugar alcohols, again, considered prebiotics. Popular sugar alcohols, erythritol, maltitol, again, the starch hydrolysis, isomalt, lactitol, mannitol, sorbitol, of course, xylitol, which we'll talk about. Okay, warning advisory here, maltitol. So maltitol is one of these sweeteners that you see that um, found in nature again and often incorporated in baked goods. Why? Because baked goods, you want a creamy consistency, you want um, something that's not going to have an aftertaste to it. So in many of the sugar-free sections of the grocery aisle, you will see baked goods, cookies, etc., that are sweetened with maltitol. And that's great for patients with diabetes, but there is a downside to it. And it's that little guy in the center here running to the toilet because it can have a lax of effect. Um, maltitol has only 2.1 kilocals per gram compared to four for sugar comprised of glucose and sorbitol. Only 80% of Swedish sugar has 47% fewer calories, does not cause dental caries, processed originally from chicory, primarily now from corn starch. And the downside of maltitol is its poor absorption because in high doses, it may have a lax of effect. Now, when it does not have to be a, an excessive laxative effect here, folks. So again, we just got done saying that polyols or polyalcohols can be a prebiotic. So it can affect your gut microbiome. And if you consume it and you're not used to it, what do you think is gonna happen? that gut microbiome is gonna be happy. And you might get some gas, you might get some bloating, and you could get even worse, all right? So when you are making the recommendation to your patients to use these products, uh, make sure they start at a subclinical dose, even gum like ice cubes. So if you tell your patient, start using this gum three times a day, five times a day, you better start off with once or twice a day and let them ramp up the, the dose because everybody's gut microbiome is different. So you don't want to have somebody use this and they go to work the next day and find out that they have to take a day off, right? So always, always, always remind your patients that this can be the um, effect of using these products, but over time, the body will assimilate 
Okay, so your gut microbiome up until the point of the recommended dosage. Everybody's different, right? Now, in protein bars, maltitol, not usually at levels higher than 20 grams, so not usually concerned, but still give your patients the respectful warning so that they can be on the lookout. All right, now when we're looking at labels of protein bars, for instance, or anything that contains the sugar alcohols, sugar alcohols are usually listed as a separate category under carbohydrates, or they may be one of the first ingredients on a list. That does not mean that the product contains mostly sugar alcohol. I had that question uh, last time. So again, that is how sugar alcohols are displayed on the label. And we'll be looking at one in a, a second here. So similar molecular weight, creamy consistency, great in baked goods and candies, causes minimal insulin secretion, which is important for those that need to maintain blood glucose, can have a laxative effect, but the flip side of that, prebiotic promotes healthy gut bacteria. So we had a couple questions here about lax effect when consumed in excess. Again, not necessarily excess, depends on you. Everybody's gut microbiome is individual. Uh, desire, yep, another one about that. Um, if you have any comments about uh, anything we're talking about, I really appreciate getting a link to anything, any study that you can show, um, anything evidence-based versus opinion, because this is continuing education, all right? So, um, but if you have a question about something or concern, definitely ask it. Does it have a significant lax of effect? It, again, it's individual, Dr. Levine. So it can, it depends on the patient. So I will always recommend to have them start at a low subclinical dose. And you do have patients out there that cannot tolerate the polyols if they have IBS, for instance. IBS, whether it's C or D or mixed, the polyols will significantly disrupt them. I happen to be one of those. I had C. difficile, had a fecal transplant, developed post-infectious IBS. I will never be able to eat anything with a polyol again. And it's been a year and a half. So for those patients, it's good to know if they have digestive disorders, not to recommend these products. And they probably know that already, hopefully. All right, let's talk about erythritol's properties here. Um, erythritol... Nearly calorie-free, does not produce a laxative effect. 70% is sweet as sugar. Why aren't we using it more? It's used in foods because its physical properties mimic that of sugar. If you picked up a bag of erythritol, it looks just like table sugar. It feels like table sugar. It's less popular because it has a sort of after taste, a slight cooling effect like menthol, and it makes it undesirable in foods. So I've tried, before I had C. difficile, the beginning of the pandemic, I tried using erythritol sweetened Hershey's syrup because I love mocha lattes. It's my only vice. And I couldn't tolerate the aftertaste. Now, erythritol, again, does not have the same laxative effect as maltitol. It's nearly completely absorbed and excreted intact. So again, it's not metabolized by the body, so there's no energy. So fermentation occurs naturally in a variety of different foods given the right conditions. And it's used, we know, to produce wine, beer, yogurt. But when erythritol is manufactured, they use a natural yeast and digest dextrose. And it produces erythritol. And after the fermentation process, it's filtered it's evaporated into these crystals, purified, et cetera, and packaged up for all of you. So erythritol also found in a variety of fruits, grapes, pears, mushrooms, certain fermented foods like soy sauce and wine. And if you went to Amazon today, you'd see this product and not an endorsement, 
Uh, and notice pleasant tasting, great for reduced calories, zero sugar-free recipes, zero calories, low glycemic impact. And if you flip that bag over, you'd see warning, you know, um, for xylitol, this would be the warning. Diarrhea may occur with excessive consumption if this happens. Reduce intake or discontinue use. And there is a plateau effect according to dosage that we'll be looking at here as well. So more is not necessarily better, all right? And this product is on Amazon today. And again, if you looked at the label, you will see under total carbohydrates, sugar, alcohol, four grams, all right? Also notice the warning here, which we will revisit at the end of this presentation. Xylitol is safe for people. It can be harmful. It can be fatal to dogs. So you want to let your patients know that. Uh, they need to keep it away from their pets. I was in a veterinary emergency hospital where somebody rushed in their cocker spaniel who had consumed some strawberry jello with xylitol. Fortunately, it was not enough, but the poison center gave that little dog priority over every other dog in that um, facility. Everything shut down so that they could start emergency services on that dog. So it is a big deal. And it's because they dump their entire insulin store when they consume xylitol. All right, let's talk about xylitol's mechanism for action. Which fruit has the most xylitol content? I don't know. <laughs> I know in terms of dosage, well, berries have a very high amount of xylitol. Um, apples can as well. So, but they contain other polyols as well. All right. So again, um, fruits, berries, and we're going to be reviewing this here. Depends on how much you consume and it depends on the type of berry, the type of fruit. Okay. So let's talk about um, xylitol's mechanism for action. Cavities are caused by kerogenic bacteria, as we know. And when teeth become demineralized from these acidic metabolites that form from these kerogenic bacteria, over time, a cavity or carious lesion can form. Acid is produced in bacteria or by bacteria through what? Glycolysis. Remember the glycolic pathway? And so, mutans streptococci here, acid over time forming causes demineralization of the tooth structure, can lead to caries. All right. So we know that bacteria aggregate in dental plaque on the surfaces of teeth, and they convert glucose, fructose, sucrose into acids because of glycolysis, which is the main energy generating pathway for the bacteria for many living species. Now, what happens with the production of acid by these bacteria is that the pH in the immediate environment of the tooth structure decreases very rapidly. The saliva, the interbacterial fluid in dental plaque becomes more acidic. And some bacteria are xylitol sensitive, so they're not able to metabolize xylitol, they essentially starve. Demineralization over the time, over that time, exposed to these acidic byproducts uh, because of these kerogenic bacteria and some strains of these bacteria, because they can't metabolize xylitol when provided as a food source, produce less acid, right? And this reduces favorable conditions for tooth demineralization while increasing the favorable conditions for tooth remineralization. Now the environment over time is altered by xylitol. We know that kerogenic bacteria thrive best when living in an acidic environment. They cannot effectively metabolize xylitol, so fewer acidic meta metabolites are produced, but the dental plaque over time becomes altered. It's less acidic and it is a less favorable environment for these bacteria. Now, xylitol starvation effect, the background, kerogenic decay causing bacteria have trouble metabolizing or feeding on the xylitol. So how does this occur? It occurs at the cell wall level when xylitol, which we said is a five carbon sugar alcohol is available to these kerogenic bacteria. 
the bacteria will transport that xylitol across its cell wall via an uptake system that's really intended for fructose. So remember the molecule of sucrose was one glucose ring and one fructose ring and it had five carbons. So the bacteria, the cell wall, this uptake system is not able to differentiate between fructose or xylitol. So it starts pumping xylitol across the cell wall and this xylitol phosphate that's formed uh, continues to rise to levels where the bacteria is not able to metabolize it. And essentially that non-metabolized xylitol phosphate, because it accumulates within the bacteria, becomes toxic and the bacteria dies. Right now, regular exposure of xylitol in the oral cavity creates a situation where these carrigenic bacteria become starved or at the very extreme, they die. And this happens to um, impact the colonies, right? It impairs the well being of these colonies of bacteria. They aggregate in colonies. So that's the basis for xylitol's mechanism of action. But wait, we have more. Decreased numbers of carrigenic bacteria in black mean decreased acidic metabolites, less acidic plaque. But xylitol can also create resistance like antibiotics. So the presence of xylitol in the oral cavity favors the growth of less virulent strains of carrigenic bacteria when the resistant strains occur. Let's look at how this happens. A person's long-term exposure to xylitol tend to affect the population size of various carrigenic bacteria that live in their mouth. Why? Bacteria replicate very quickly. And because of that replication, mutations occur. And given the right environment, if that mutation is in an environment that's conducive, it's going to continue to replicate, right? Binary fission. So in this case, in xylitol resistance, within the population of carrigenic bacteria that are in the plaque, some will have a genetically altered fructose uptake system, one that cannot transport xylitol across its cell wall. Because of this, the bacteria will not accumulate the toxic levels of xylitol phosphate, and there is a population shift that occurs. This means that the xylitol-resistant bacteria continue to thrive where their xylitol-sensitive counterparts will not. And then over time, the sensitive bacteria, those sensitive to the xylitol are going to decrease and the xylitol resistant ones will predominate the population. Research suggests that xylitol resistant strains of carrigenic bacteria, less virulent, meaning less capable of causing tooth decay than their counterparts. Why does that happen? Well, the theory is that xylitol resistant bacteria have impaired adhesive properties. So bacteria, mutant streptococci do the damage when they're able to aggregate and adhere to the tooth surface. But if that is impaired, they're not going to be able to do quite the damage anymore, right? So the ability of bacteria to cause caries depends on their ability to adhere to the tooth surface. These xylitol resistant strains of carrigenic bacteria due to their impaired adhesive properties have less ability to create these ideal conditions for tooth demineralization and therefore less tooth decay. Any questions about what we've covered so far? It's a lot of material. All right, let's talk then about sources of xylitol. And again, for those of you that joined a little late, be sure you have the CE credit instructions in the handout by tapping on the banner at the top of the screen. Also review the instructions that we have in the chat area here. I'm going to go ahead and repost it. And for those watching the recording, you are going to scroll down below the video player to the instructions section. Number two is the handout, number three is the quiz. All right, 
sources of xylitol. So we said xylitol is a polio sugar and it's referred often as birch sugar as a source. Natural sources of xylitol, getting to the question about which fruit has more, found in fruits and plants, plums, strawberries, raspberries, and rowan berries, and the human body produces about 10 grams of xylitol per day. Xylitol birch sugar, this is a birch forest here, and if you know anything about birch trees, they have skinny trunks, thin bark, the canopy is sort of higher off the ground. Xylitol is manufactured from plant materials that are rich in xylitol. And uh, xylitol occurs freely in nature, as we see. And as we said, the human body produces xylitol. You may see that on your quiz. It's more economical to produce xylitol from some sources than others, as we'll see. Xylitol, also, again, a byproduct of human metabolism, the glucoronate xylose cycle. So the human body produces xylitol. So if you have a patient that tells you they're allergic to it, um, take a deeper dive. Maybe they're not, um, maybe xylitol is not compatible for them. Maybe they have IBS or something like that. Okay. So there are a couple different sources that are used in the manufacturing world of xylitol. One is the corn cob and the corn cob um, is considered an uh, inexpensive source, so to speak, as we'll see birch tree as well, but the birch tree has to be cut down when it's manufactured for xylitol. And so you have to reharvest an entire tree. Corn cobs are generally thrown away. So they're a much better source. And you're going to see that the process to manufacture xylitol is called the biomass hydrolysis process, BHP. Let's take a look at that. So um, the biomass here are corn cobs. They're subject to acid hydrolysis. In this case, they use sulfuric acid. They also use hydrochloric acid. And 90% comes off the top as biomass waste. Here in the US, US, we have to store biomass waste somewhere. We can't throw it in a landfill anymore. I grew up in Pennsylvania back in the days. They just threw it in the Allegheny River. That's how it worked and polluted all the streams. Now it has to be stored somewhere. And when that happens, it's very costly. Right? So many of these companies took their processing to China to pollute China instead. And we're going to see that the Chinese developed a way to use some of this biomass waste to convert it to ethanol. All right, so again, 90% biomass waste, 10% sugar liqueur. Then through multi-step purification, more wastewater comes off. We get down to the xylose units and further purification and evaporation to the xylitol crystals. That's it in a nutshell. Corn cobs, high xylose content, 25%. We heard, we heard a question from someone, how, what fruit has the most xylitol? I can tell you corn cobs overall for plants has the one of the highest contents. Okay, so again, the Chinese developed a manufacturing of the biomass waste to convert it to ethanol, so it would have less environmental impact. So after these corn cobs are subjected to the BHP, their extraction steps further converts it to xylitol, and then separation and evaporation to yield the crystals. Healthcare policy of sweeteners, any questions about the manufacturing of xylitol? Okay, so since World War I, the public sugar consumption, as we saw, continued to creep upward, except during World War II, and because of this, there have been many uh, public health initiatives to curb sugar. We have here in Maricopa County, soda-free summers or the dental associations will have buyback Halloween candy and so forth. We recognize it as a priority. Communities have attempted to restrict the sale in their schools as well. Certainly in the dental world, we know that we can bolster public awareness through 
benefits of replacing sugar with these polyols. And we talked about sugar or xylitol as a sugar alcohol earlier. Its theoretic caloric value is four kilocals per gram. And its actual practical value, excuse me, is 2.3 because of why? Incomplete absorption of xylitol. And xylitol cannot be metabolized by plaque bacteria. And it's thought that is because of why? The structural component of the bacteria being able to pump the um, xylitol instead of fructose. But we also have accumulated evidence that suggests the following, that mutant streptococci are the target organisms of xylitol in vivo. Reduced to remain at lower levels even during long-term xylitol consumption, but that consumption has to be continuous. Once you stop consuming xylitol, it doesn't work anymore. Once consumed by mothers, it reduces the mother to child transmission of mutant streptococci, consequently carries occurrence in their children, and xylitol consumption reduces the risk of carriers in children. Question about GMO crops are concerned to be bad for gut health. Would the birch bark be healthier? Um, they're using, Michelle, that's a good question. If you look at some of the bags of xylitol, it will say GMO-free source. Now, so for instance, GMO-free corn, right? Now, I was speaking to an owner of a xylitol manufacturing plant in China who told me the concern here, though, is they can ship the GMO-free corn to China, but what are they getting back? Because in some cases, there's a term that is used, dirty xylitol, where it becomes contaminated at the plant, right? There's less um, oversight of the conditions in that manufacturing plant. So it's a good question. But the birch bark could be healthier. It could have been exposed to DDT. We don't know that either, right? So um, research reveals that xylitol, again, can reduce the mother-child transmission of dental caries. And this was a study during pregnancy. And let me go back here. And the mothers began chewing xylitol gum beginning in the third to fifth months of pregnancy. This was a randomized controlled trial over 28 months. What they found, what they confirmed that xylitol gum chewing during pregnancy was effective as an early intervention for reducing the mother to child transmission of MS. And a patient needs to take xylitol with regularity though. Compliance pay, plays a major contributing factor. If you stop using it, it doesn't work. What they found here that the xylitol group children were less significant, less, they were significantly less likely to be MS positive than the control group at and after nine months of age. And they reported that children whose mothers did chew xylitol gum or did not chew the xylitol gum acquired MS inoculation 8.8 .8 months earlier than the mothers who did chew gum or the infants of the mothers who did chew gum. So the results from their trial revealed that maternal exposure to xylitol chewing gum provided intervention by preventing or delaying this transmission and expectant mothers will need to chew xylitol gum three to five times a day, beginning in the third to fifth months of pregnancy. And I did incorporate xylitol chewing gum here in our county maternal oral health program, also here at Native Health Services as well. But again, you wanna start a subtherapeutic dose for the reasons we spoke about earlier to mitigate for gas cramp, bloating, and um, of course, diarrhea. Now, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry in their statement in 2015 here had concerns about quite a few of the trials that were used for xylitol. One was that they believed if you are testing chewing gum, that just by nature of chewing, the saliva that will produce would have a buffering effect as well. And they believe that to be a confounding factor. Um, so, and they were concerned about the, the intake, the amount, how do you deliver it to a toddler? For instance, you're not going to give a toddler chewing gum. And so they had concerns about the studies. They did support further research though, and recognized that um, even though there's a lack of consistent evidence, 
that xylitol has some merit and it should be further investigated. So many of you probably went through the stage with your toddler and uh, it could be an ear infection tugging on the ears. I certainly had a daughter that went through that in my second year of dental school. She was 20 months old and had just one ear infection after the other, right? Why does this happen? Because infants are primarily horizontal at this stage. Teeth aren't fully erupted, jaws aren't fully formed. The eustachian tube is shorter. It's uh, just a hop, skip and a jump to the middle ear. So if a child gets an upper respiratory cold, goes right into the middle ear and they get ear infection one after another. And it's a very hard space to treat. Now for adults, of course, more vertical and less of a concern. So there were many, many studies and these are just a few. This was a meta-analysis where they, they showed that healthy children can reduce the incidence or the risk of acute otitis media by chewing two pieces of xylitol chewing gum five times a day. This child isn't going to be chewing chewing gum five times a day, right? So that would be a difficult way to deliver it. So we have quite a few of these studies. So we had a Dr. Milgram, who did another study, as we'll see, who found that if you used xylitol syrup in these children twice a day, rather than having them chew gum five times a day, even if they could, that they had almost near the efficacy, right? So in this study, they found in a two to three month follow-up trial, approximately 40% uh, when chewing gum efficacy compared to 30% with those that used xylitol syrup. And this was Dr. Ohari from Finland. They showed that ear infections in children could be reduced up to 40% with eight to 10, eight to nine grams, I'm sorry, of oral xylitol every day. And this was the another um, investigation where they reported MS levels and plaque decreased as exposure to xylitol increased. This is important because there was a plateau effect that occurred, 6.88 to 10.32 grams per day. All right, in addition here, the effectiveness of xylitol is dependent on a minimum quantity and frequency. So patient compliance is really important. If you had a toddler, you're not going to chase them around five times a day with xylitol. That's not practical. Um, xylitol oral syrup, this is the Milgram study, very important. You're gonna see this on your quiz. Administered twice daily, total daily dose, eight grams, found to be effective in preventing childhood carries. Only two applications of the syrup required per day. And that sort of, they felt disputed the confounding factor of chewing gum that they believed it was the xylitol that um, had the anti-carogenic effect. Another study using xylitol gummy bears, large study, and they found that um, significantly reduced levels of mutans streptococci. Another study here, um, treating xerostomia with xylitol. Many of the over-the-counter products out there contain xylitol. We're going to hear about one that has a synergistic effect with molecular iodine. And xerostomia is a huge problem. This is a course that I present. It's one of the most um, rapidly growing oral health pro problems that we have in first world countries because it often is from polypharmacy, right? Now, Xylitol products, this study demonstrated that the use of these novel topical dry mouth products increased significantly unstimulated whole salivary flow rates, reduced complaints of xerostomia and improved xerostomia associated quality of life. And we know that xylitol is particularly useful treating xerostomia. It reduces the risk of root caries due to xerostomia and restores balance and harmony to the oral tissues. Ventilator-associated pneumonia, this is a study where they used aerosolized xylitol with um, great results. Fluoride varnish and xylitol, it depends on your preference. Um, this study, there are many studies, look and see if somebody has supported the study, et cetera. I've used it with and without, I have no preference myself. Erythritol versus xylitol, erythritol in this study, large study found to be more efficacious 
than xylitol. And now briefly here, we're going to talk about the xylitol molecular um, iodine rinse combo in these studies. Question here. I always see uh, strep mutans mentioned in xylitol literature. Do you know if xylitol is also non-digestible by lactobacilli? Depends on the strain. I don't have study off the top of my head, but I focused on mutans streptococci tonight. And you'll see in the slides also Haemophilus and others that um, inhabit the upper respiratory area. So again, it depends on the strain, first of all. So take a look. We also have other mutans strains, sanguis, et cetera, that benefit. Well, they don't benefit. We benefit by xylitol. Does chewing gum three times have a day have a higher possibility of irritating TMJ? It can in some of your patients. So um, they can use mints instead and they should let the mint dissolve over time, five minutes rather than chewing it. Do you have a preference for over-the-counter xylitol chewing gum brand to recommend patients? Nope. I worked in public health. I gave out whatever they gave me and it worked. So um, I did not. Yeah. Um, I've had at least three patients with Sjogren's disease say that biotin products do not work well. Do you know if xylitol provides relief for these patients? So they do. And I've treated many um, Sjogren's patients. I'm from the land of Sjogren's patients at UC San Francisco. We used, we would have samples of biotin and so forth um, sent to us. I'm going to talk to you about this combination though of xylitol molecular iodine because it has been found to demonstrate superior efficacy and in terms of Sjogren's patients, it really depends on how they're affected. And usually you're going to incorporate the xylitol rinse with other therapies as well for xerostomia. And I do a much deeper dive in xerostomia in the course that I present. So we talk about uh, low level laser and so forth. Okay, so xylitol molecular iodine rinse um, these are studies here. Uh, this was a xylitol molecular iodine rinse that was found to be far more effective than any other rinse tested. It was the only rinse to completely inactivate periodontal pathogens. Testing was conducted at a 30 second exposure to the presence of whole human saliva, which is important because not all oral rinses are tested in the presence of whole human saliva. So you can take a look at this slide. And um, if you stay on here to hear a, a brief video, from Dr. Uh, Moskowitz. He's going to go into a much deeper dive here. But what about molecular iodine and xylitol combined as an antiseptic rinse? So if you look at FN here and Prevotelor Intermediate, complete inactivation by molecular iodine when combined with xylitol for both chlorhexidine gluconate, 20 times less effective, uh, cetylperidinium chloride, 800,000 times less effective. We've got chlorine dioxide, povidone iodine, hydrogen peroxide, and stabilized chlorine dioxide, 940,000 uh, times less effective. So I have tom molecular iodine rinse completely effective in 30 seconds against periodontal bacteria, karyogenic bacteria, and upper respiratory viruses, including SARS-CoV-2, right? In the same time frame, chlorhexidine gluconate, only partially effective. And here we go. Molecular iodine combined with xylitol versus chlorhexidine gluconate, lock reduction at 30 seconds. Prevotella, complete inactivation, chlorhexidine gluconate 700 times less effective. FN, complete inactivation, 20 times less effective for chlorhexidine gluconate. When we get down to SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV folks, Complete inactivation of SARS-CoV-2, 600 times less effective chlorhexidine gluconate, and yet it was recommended to be used as a pre-procedural rinse. Okay, xylitol molecular iodine rinse completely effective against SARS-CoV-2 within 30 seconds. And again, the antiviral pre-rinses recommended by the ADA in their interim guidance 
hydrogen peroxide, which has been banned by Health Canada because it doesn't work. Chlorhexidine gluconate, not completely effective, not even at 60 seconds. Antiviral efficacy against SARS-CoV-2. This was research done uh, August 3rd, 2020 at Utah State University. When you compare hydrogen peroxide to povidone iodine to chlorhexidine gluconate to xylitol molecular iodine combination, xylitol molecular iodine comes out the winner again, complete inactivation. Look at chlorhexidine gluconate. Now look at povidone iodine, observed cytotoxicity. Zero, none, didn't do anything. Okay. Clinicians report evaluated antiseptic oral rinses for the efficacy against SARS-CoV-2 and the only rinse, the only rinse they found to be effective in the presence of saliva was a xylitol molecular iodine rinse. And you'll see that on the next slide. And there it is for you. Xylitol and other sugar alcohols may be harmful or fatal if ingested by your pet. So again, um, make sure that your patients know this. Advise your patients. I've got a couple of links here for you. And note, if your dogs love peanut butter like mine do, some of the peanut butter companies have now started adding xylitol, but they haven't informed folks. So uh, always take a good look at the label. Let your patients know this is a link to Poison Control Center and the website. So um, take a good look at your peanut butter labels. We have other resources here for you. Uh, oral rinses, what's safe, what's effective is offered monthly live and on demand by Dr. Moskowitz. And he goes through every oral chemistry. Katie wants to know what about the comparisons to sodium hypochlorite? They're in this course um, and uh, I can tell you my periodontist has us rinse with sodium hypochlorite, can I tell you how much I hate it? It tastes terrible. If you've had surgery, it burns. It's not a good way to introduce your patient to the practice. It's efficacious for sure. Okay, xerostomia is the course that I teach as well. And any other questions? What about all the other periopathogens? This, um, Katie, again, this was just a very abbreviated view take the oral rinses course because Dr. Moskowitz goes through all of it for you. And it's a one and a half hour course. <clears throat> okay. Um, we are going to now invite Jason on from Iotech International. So if you are not going to stay. This is a time to log out. We hope that you will. You'll learn more about Xylitol's new ultra rinse that contains, I'm sorry, Iotech's new ultra rinse that contains Xylitol. And these are some of the studies. And I'm going to start by playing a quick video. Hi, Jason. Hello. How are you? We are great. So we have a large class here. I'm going to play a brief video from Dr. Moskowitz. And he's going to give you further information about what I just covered. And again, I would encourage you to take the course, Oral Rinses, What's Safe, What's Effective. It's on demand. It's also live every month. <clears throat> I'm going to be on mute. You're already aware that xylitol offers multiple benefits when incorporated into oral care products. A key benefit is that xylitol is not metabolized by karyogenic bacteria. But xylitol's benefits are magnified many times over when combined with molecular iodine. As an example, Irins Ultra, a patented, non-staining xylitol molecular iodine oral rinse, is far more effective in inactivating periodontal pathogens than either chlorhexidine gluconate povidone iodine, chlorine dioxide, stabilized chlorine dioxide, acetylpyridinium chloride, or hydrogen peroxide. The table shown provides the results of rigorous testing in the presence of saliva. The testing compared the biocidal efficacy of seven different antiseptic rinses 
with a 30-second exposure to two prominent periodontal pathogens, Fusobacterium nucleatum and Prevotella intermedia. A key finding was that the xylitol molecular iodine rinse, Iorinse Ultra, shown in the top row, completely inactivated both pathogens and was the only rinse able to do so. The next most effective rinse was chlorhexidine gluconate, but its effectiveness was limited, ranging from being 20 times less effective to 700 times less effective than Iorinse Ultra. The other rinses were tens of thousands of times less effective, hundreds of thousands of times less effective, or not effective at all. The take home message is that no oral rinse is as safe and effective as Iorinse Ultra. If you like xylitol, you and your patients are going to love Iorinse Ultra. Okay, everyone, I am excited to introduce to you Jason. Jason Garris is the Vice President of Global Sales for Iotech International, a world leader in molecular iodine research and development. <clears throat> he previously, <clears throat> excuse me, founded and served as CEO of Garris Associates, a pioneer in guerrilla social media tactics. During his tenure, Jason personally trained thousands of sales professionals and hundreds of management teams on three continents in cutting edge social media strategies. So welcome, Jason, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, first, I wanna say uh, again, like I always do, uh, thank you very much, Kirsten, for having me here tonight. And uh, and I would like to thank you all for being here. Uh, it means a lot to be able to educate um, dentists and hygienists and, and, uh, and have them learn about our technology. Um, you know, back in 2013, my uncle, Dr. Herbert Moskowitz, had a vision of trying to see if we can make uh, molecular iodine stable. And um, let me explain really quick what we're talking about here. Uh, when you talk about molecular iodine, what is molecular iodine? Molecular iodine is the bacteria killing uh, agent that does the uh, that kills the germs and bacteria. Uh, and it, it's the it's the only active it, that kills the germs in povidone iodine. When you look at the bottle on your left hand side, the red bottle, what I did so I can show you guys what you're looking at is I put these red marbles in there, and that indicates povidone iodine. But you see that little blue marble uh, on your left there. There's one blue marble. And that blue marble out of all of those red marbles is the only active that kills germs and that's called molecular iodine. And all those red balls that are in there, not effective, staining, toxicity, uh, contributes to different problems. And, and therefore, when you look at this, since 1950s, they haven't done anything with povidone iodine until 2017. 2015, actually, uh, is when my uncle, Dr. Herb Moskowitz, uh, increased the levels of molecular iodine and, and suppressed the other forms of iodine that are in povidone iodine. See, povidone iodine is, is a mixture of different iodines, with iodide, iodate, and triiodide. And, and so there's different forms of iodine, but only one active kills germs and that's what we are worried about is is killing germs and bacteria and doing it safely and what's beautiful about iodine is an essential nutrient so imagine something so deadly to germs but yet so safe for human consumption so when we talk about iodine uh, molecular iodine rinse let's talk about like you know in your mouth the saliva first of all uh when you when you test the rinse. You have to test it in fresh, whole human saliva because your saliva actually neutralizes the rinses. And um, so therefore, um, when you look at molecular iodine uh, on the top, we actually 
wipe out Fusobacteria nucleatum, we wipe out Prevotella, and the other three, uh, Pophomonas, Tanarella, uh, you know, and so we so we do a, a great job there, but we have a complete kill. And and when you're rinsing, I'm I, I'm almost positive that you would want a complete kill of those bacteria that are actually getting in your bloodstream and then causing more problems in your body other than just bleeding gums. And so those bacteria that are in your mouth and, and as the future, as we go into it, there's more systemic health problems that comes from those bacteria, not just bleeding gums, not swollen gums, but many problems. And so when we eliminate those bacteria, we are actually helping and saving lives and helping patients and helping with their bleeding gums in general. So when you look at the molecular iodine, our product, you'll see up on top, you'll see we completely wipe out and clorexidine, the next one down, stains, you can't use it long term. There's um, ours is something you can use every day. You need an antimicrobial daily. You have to. Brushing and flossing is just not enough for many patients. They need an antimicrobial rinse and they need a strong one and they need a safe one and they need something that they can feel confident that they're getting the job done. And that's what you're seeing here. All the other rinses that are tested and used in dental offices worldwide and hospitals, you look here and you'll see how effective our rinse is. Well, when you're looking over here is I got a text from a friend the other day and he says, uh, you know, he had a cleaning and he wanted to tell me that uh, they prescribed the rinse. And I'm sure you guys can all tell me what rinse that this rinse is. And the hygienist told my friend that it is apparently normal. No, it is not normal. No, it's not. It's not safe. It's not normal. Uh, I, I and just kidding around here. I don't think date night went very well uh, with him uh, uh, that night. Uh, I'm only joking. Uh, that said, it, it's an embarrassing um, to have that tongue look like that and also feel uncomfortable. And also, uh, if it's not being effective, what are we doing? What are we doing to these patients? Why are we staining their teeth? Why are we giving them something for something that's a long term problem? It's just a short term fix. And so, um, so again, that is chlorexidine glutenate. Um, so that's, that's what you see here. When you see our products, I'm going to start going through our products so you guys can understand what we have. We have award winning products, and I'm going to start off with our very first product, which is Iowans Ultra. Iowans Ultra is, is molecular iodine, 100 parts per million of molecular iodine. And remember that povidone iodine, the active that kills the germs is one to three parts per million. This right here is 100 parts per million of molecular iodine. And the active in here is acetylpyridinium chloride. So this rinse mixed with xylitol, and we talked about xylitol tonight and the benefits there, it has glycerin in it. It is great for dry mouth. It is great for bleeding gums. It is wonderful for gingivitis. It is a powerful reversal for gingivitis. And, and the best part is it is available in your dental office to be sold. It is sold for uh, you in a dental office for $14 a bottle. And you guys can sell that recommended for $40 a bottle um, for your patients when they leave. It is a wonderful new profit center. It is a wonderful at-home rinse. It is wonderful for the patients to leave with something to go home with that's going to help them get better. Uh, and it is a wonderful product. It is sold by the case. This is the one liter bottle. It also comes in the 16 ounce size bottles as well, where it's $9.46 and, um, and it is 24 bottles and you can sell for $27 roughly per bottle. It is a great pre-procedure rinse, an at-home rinse. And so when you're rinsing in a dental office, Gordon Christensen recommends rinse twice, two 30-second swishes, because once you rinse out the first time, you got that first load out, and then you're going to go in and get your another rinse, and you're going to get that tissue cleaned out as well and get the skin. It's just going to be wonderful for uh, 
your oral cavity there. So anyway, rinsing, pre-procedure rinsing is wonderful. Um, again, so you can use the Ireland's ready to use soft mint. Does not have cetoperidinium chloride in it. Uh, the difference that I will tell you between Ireland's Ultra is that is an FDA approved product. For many of you that say, I only want to stock an FDA approved product, well, that's Ireland's Ultra for you. If you want Ireland's ready to use, this is not an FDA uh, approved product, but it is what all the dentists are using right now, and it is a popular one. It has molecular iodine, the same effectiveness, and um, and it is the um, Ireland's RTU. 30-second swish in the morning, 30-second swish in the evening. It has xylitol. It is pleasant tasting. It is actually a super seller on Amazon. Uh, I can't begin to tell you how many bottles we sell a day. Today is, we did a, we, we are, Unbelieve our sales are unbelievable uh, today on Amazon, and a lot of bottles went out of Ireland's ready to use. Now, the beautiful part is we do sell it on Amazon, and we keep our prices at forty to sixty dollars a bottle. So, if you're buying it for thirteen dollars a bottle, right, and you're recommending it for your patients, and they're buying it for forty, right, or thirty-five, you're you're selling it cheaper than they can get it on Amazon. So, their confidence is they would. Um, they would be able to um, order from you and, and buy from you directly right there. Sending the patient home with something they could do daily without staining, no bacterial resistance. It is a wonderful daily rinse. This is the green apple version. Uh, that's what we actually first came out with years ago. Uh, still around. Uh, many people like it. Um, and it's just a preference of flavor. 16 ounce bottles in them as well. Islands concentrate. Any of you that do scaling and root planning in your office, this is a dynamite product. Um, it is a wonderful product for them for scaling and root planning. It's one part concentrate, three parts water, and that's what you would uh, do your scaling with. And also your syringe, you could use this straight in the syringe. And when you fill the syringe up, fill it up fresh. Don't leave it overnight. What you're going to do is you fill that up and you're going to drop those little, uh, a little bit into each pocket there. And it is a wonderful um, for scaling and root planting. And it's a great for your syringe and for irrigation. It is a great product. But here's the best and exciting part. It's multi-purpose because when a patient goes home with a bottle of the Ireland's concentrate, they take one capful. They put it into a water pitch and they water floss with that. And the idea of water flossing with the iodine, it is unbelievable how effective it is and how fast those bleeding gums stop, the swelling and all those great things that you're trying to accomplish for your patient. And it is a wonderful product. So here, $20 a bottle, sells for $50 to $60 a bottle. It is a treatment. It is an at-home treatment. Mrs. Jones, yes. Do you have a water pick at home? I do. Do you, I want you to use a pickpocket tip. I want you to fill up the, I want you to take one capful, put it in the water flosser, fill it up to 300 ml. And remember the capful is 30 ml, so 10 times the amount. And what you're going to do is you're going to water floss with a pickpocket tip, low setting, and you're going to let that water flosser work and get that pickpocket up there. And that pickpocket, in a six millimeter pocket goes 90% in there and gets to the source. And it is wonderful to rinse with the iodine. And it's safe, it's effective, and it does not hurt the machine. Uh, my, my machine, I, I've been using it for almost over a year now and no problems at all. IO gel. IO gel, another product that contains xylitol. IO gel is a molecular iodine gel that goes into like a perio protect tray or a den mat tray, or you can even make a tray in your office for your patient, three millimeter thick, soft EDA tray. And what you're going to be able to do is the patient wears the tray 10 minutes a day to five minutes a day. And the idea is to put the IO gel in the tray rather than using hydrogen peroxide gel. Okay, you're going to use IO gel, which is the molecular iodine gel, and it is wonderful because it's compatible with the gums. 
It is, it's unbelievable what it does for the inflammation in the gums. And it is a fabulous um, uh, product for uh, helping to um, treat the gums. The nasal spray, IO mist. You wouldn't believe this. We just got done talking about molecular iodine being the active in povidone iodine. And it's only found at one to three parts per million. There's 36,000 parts per million of, molec of, of uh, total iodine in povidone iodine. But only three parts per million kills germs. Well, here's a product. This is a saline mist spray with molecular iodine in it. We cannot make any claims on what the product does. But we can say it's a saline mist spray. And what's beautiful about it is, is that, you know, it is a great saline spray with molecular iodine. It's just common sense what the molecular iodine would do and, and the benefits of it. But then in, there is um, the saline in general is wonderful. So it is a wonderful saline nasal spray. Uh, any of you allergy sufferers out there, it is a fabulous um, spray. It can be sold, it can be bought in your practice, it can be used. Um, so again, uh, molecular iodine saline nasal spray. IO Shield is a nasal barrier cream. It is a really cool cream. It's actually, believe it or not, this is the cream right here. And what it is, is you take that, I take it a Q-tip and you swab your nose here and here, and that molecular iodine sits on your nostrils there. And actually, it's a nasal barrier, uh, prevents against viral shedding. And so the idea is, is that um, putting a little on your nose, uh, it, it just is a wonderful nasal barrier cream with molecular iodine. Again, we don't make any claims as if we prevent anything or do anything. It's just common sense. It is molecular iodine, um, uh, and it does have uh, it does have that barrier uh, action where it does cover that uh, area up. And also when people breathe in, breathe out is a wonderful uh, barrier cream. Um, that said, uh, next slide we're gonna talk about is IO Cleanse. Uh, again, this is uh, 200 parts per million of molecular iodine. Remember that povidone iodine is used in hospitals as a surgical scrub, and it's used at one to three parts per million. This is 200 parts per million of the active of molecular iodine. We cannot call it a hand sanitizer, it is just a hand cleanser. And the idea is, is unlike the um, povidone iodine, when surgeons scrub, their hands come home yellow, right? Well, in this case, my hands are clear and, and I'm getting the, uh, my hands are being clean. So it is a wonderful hand cleanser. This is exciting and, um, you know, we're going to talk about this here, and this is really exciting for all of you to know, is the power of molecular iodine. The VOHC did a study and using molecular iodine, adding one milliliter of molecular iodine, one milliliter of molecular iodine. Here, here's the syringe here. But let's just take one milliliter of molecular iodine and adding that to eight ounces, one cup of water. Okay, so just that little bit, one milliliter to one cup of water. You take the molecular iodine, the IOVET oil, the pet water additive, and you put this in the pet's drinking water, and it is stronger than brushing. The VOHC did a study that says that using molecular iodine daily is stronger than a veterinarian brushing the dog's teeth every single day. And the idea is you can add this to the pet's drinking water. And when they drink it, the iodine helps with the gums. It removes the plaque stronger than brushing. And I got the study. Don't worry. I'm going to send you the study. If any of you guys are interested in Ayurveda oil, I'll send you all this information. Please do me a favor, all of you. Can you please hit the reach out to the little red banner right there? Everybody that's on here tonight, I'm going to send a free sample. For everybody, for the um, for our products, we're going to send a free sample in literature so that you guys can actually read and learn and try our products. Any of your offices that want to do a virtual learn, I will spend my time to make sure that we can educate your team about what our products do, and and I would love for you guys to replace 
it instead of using chloroxidine and things that don't work, and instead of using anything that you think might work, it's so important for you to know what works. And, and this is a great at-home treatment for your patients, finally. And we're in thousands of dental offices and so many DSOs are coming on right now and so many hospitals. And, and um, it's really a cool thing um, once you really learn um, about, our, about our technology. Um, next is, this is called IORINCH MR, Maximum Relief. And this is 4.5% uh, glycerin mixed with molecular iodine, 100 parts per million with xylitol. This is unbelievable for canker sores. This is unbelievable for patients who have chemotherapy or radiation and they get the head neck cancer and they wind up with oral mucositis. When you get oral mucositis, you'll wind up on a feeding tube. If you wind up on a feeding tube, it affects your whole outcome, your treatment altogether. And nobody wants to get sores while, or dry mouth or xerostemia or any of those things while they're, while they're, um, uh, while, they're, while they're dealing with cancer. Cancer enough is already a problem. And, and this is going to be an incredible rinse because in your dental office, the minute you open a patient's mouth and you see sores, ulcers, anything going on in the mouth, and you send them home with nothing, now you can send them home with something that's going to help them. By the way, it may be a great idea to ask those people, how are you feeling? I noticed you got those canker sores. I got something that will help you. Go home and use it. It's a profit center, and it's helping them. And believe it or not, people will get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 in the morning to get out of pain, and they'll run over to CVS 24 hours and find something to get out of pain. Believe me, nobody wants to be in pain. And so this is a wonderful rinse for dry mouth, ulcers, canker sores. And it's, that's going to be coming out. And many dental offices will be stocking it for that reason. When you look here at a failed gingival graft over here, you can see, you can see what IORINS did uh, to help close up those uh, the, the failed graft. And what's really exciting about it is the uh, periodontist scheduled the patient to come back because they were going to regraft and do another graft. They just needed time for it to heal. But the patient went home with IORINS. Sure enough, it healed on its own with the IORINS. It is a wonderful, powerful rinse. Please take the class with my uncle, Dr. Herb Mouskowitz on, um, on this product because it is going to give you 1.5 credits. You'll learn about the other rinses, the effectiveness, why, why the, why the iodine is, is what it, you know, why we came up with it. And you'll learn, you'll learn the history about this and why it's so important to use in your practice. Look at the tongue. There's nothing worse than sores in the mouth and people. You would be so amazed at how quickly these sores go away. It, it's a matter of fact, it's actually amazing how the mouth heals faster than most parts of the body. But, but especially with the molecular iodine rinses, it is an unbelievable product for this type of stuff. So um, again, IORINS MR is a fabulous product. IORINS Ultra is a great product. All the, anything to do with when you mix molecular iodine, iodine in general has been around for history, history, years. We've been using it. It's just all we did was we took all the things that didn't need to be there out. We increased the level of molecular iodine in it. We made it stable where it could last two years in a bottle. We made it so that patients can go home and rinse daily. No bacterial resistance. And don't have to worry about the material safety data sheets saying it's a carcinogen or toxic. That said, we do have a, uh, a brand ambassador program um, for, for hygienists and dentists that want to, that instead of stocking the products, they want to recommend to their patients. They, they actually will be rewarded for doing so. Um, you know, we, you can sign up other dental offices that are not using our products. If they sign up, we, 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 uh, we, we, uh, we certainly love to compensate uh, anybody that does help us um, with our sales in general. And 
Not only that, but it is wonderful for hygienists and dentists who are looking for um, another avenue within the office to increase revenue. It is, it is a wonderful for your office. All I'm asking all of you to do tonight is, I know I spoke in 30 minutes about iodine technology. Well, I know that you're not gonna absorb all of it in 30 minutes, and I know that you're probably lost right now, um, but I can tell you that if you hit that reach, reach out and, and you hit Jason Garris banner, you just fill out that information. I'm going to send everybody a free sample that fills out the banner. I'm also gonna send not only a free sample, I'm gonna send the literature, and I am also would love to set up a office learn with you guys. Um, and for those offices that have a lot of people involved, of course, I'd love to have a lunch and learn with you. Um, so uh, and so I, I'd love to be on your winning team. And uh, and your winning team is is about your patients winning. And and when they go home happy with an answer, with something that works effective, safe, and something that, that's not gonna stain their teeth and they're gonna feel more, uh, uh, you know, better about their bleeding gums issues and all this other problems that they go home with, this is it. This is a winning product. It is a super product to make money in your practice. And um, again, I, I, I encourage you all to hit the reach out, the banner, that banner right there is gold. Uh, because uh, when you hit that banner, uh, again, I will send everybody free samples and for you to try it yourself and uh, in literature and anything else. And again, thank you, Kirsten, for having me. I, I thank you. Questions. Thank you. We appreciate the support. I want to tell everybody, too, um, you all have a copy of Jason's presentation in your course folder. So if this is information that you want to take back to your practice or maybe your hygienist in your multiple practices, you can share this. If you tap on the banner at the top of the screen, the red banner, you can bookmark that URL. You can save that to your device, take it back to your practices tomorrow as well. And on this slide, we also, which is clickable for you as a PDF, um, there is the link to that banner. So um, to get your free samples, take the link back or set up a lunch and learn with Jason or all of the above. That's the way to do it. That's the way to contact Jason. And you also have his number here. You can phone or call him. He does get back to you. And we thank you all for being here. I want to give a shout out to Deborah B because she's a great supporter of our program on social media and so forth. So I appreciate you being here, Deborah. And I appreciate everyone being here. We've got another Kirsten from Pennsylvania. Um, so Jason, I'm looking to see, we had some questions about allergies. I think I answered them for them, um, that, uh, we're talking about different species here. So the body produces iodine, right? Um, it's an essential ingredient as well. So, uh, what you can do is do a little test on the patient's wrist. And if you take the oral rinses course by Dr. Moskowitz, He'll go through all of that and you get a, a, a one and a half CE credit. So it's available on demand, also live next week, I believe. If you go to the handout for the CE class, you'll see the link to that class for you. Anything you want to say, Jason? Yeah, so uh, really quick is um, as, as far as allergies go, um, because of the molecular iodine, uh, molecular iodine is one species within itself, and, and what we have talked about was suppressing the other species of iodine that are in the uh, povidone iodine, which is iodide and iodate, and those are the um, uh, th those are the I uh, different iodines that affect the thyroid and and affect other things. But but there is no iodide and there is no iodate in in molecular iodine uh, products. And also, as far as like a shellfish allergy, if does anybody ever wants to know, it's usually what we call the tropomyosin muscle. Uh, it's tropomyosin, uh, which is a muscle protein in, um, in shellfish. It is not the iodine. Your, your body needs iodine, and um, you're more likely to have an allergic reaction to another rinse before you have an, uh, an allergic reaction to this rinse, um, uh, in, naturally speaking. But 
That said, really quick is um, we talked about the Iovet oil, the pet water additive. And tonight I wore my necklace that I have here, you can see here. Uh, and this necklace is a necklace with my Rottweiler on it and my dog. And uh, it actually, if you look over here, you can see my dog's actually sitting there tonight, hanging out. And and again, I take pride in my dog's teeth. And it is so important to take care of the dog's teeth like it's your own. And that's when we came up with Ayurveda Oil because we know that people aren't doing anything with their dogs. And, they're, and what they're doing is they're throwing a bone in the dog's mouth. And, and they say these, these bones say removes plaque and cleans teeth. And then, so if the dog's a chewer on the right side, what about the left side? So um, again, uh, it is a wonderful product. Uh, and, and I will be sending out some information as well in those information packets for those that are interested in the uh, pet water additive side as well. And it's for dogs and cats, right, Jason? Dogs and cats, yes. That was and, a question. And no okay. xylitol. There is no xylitol. There's no xylitol in that product. In the molecular iodine. And you don't want to use the other product that has right. xylitol. You want to use the one for the pet. Um, again, before we close, be sure to tap on the red banner at the top of the screen, bookmark it so you can take it back to your practices. For your patients with xerostomia, um, you know, they're, they're prone to fungal infections, um, also mouth sores, denture lesions. And this product um, is a fabulous antiviral as well as antifungal. So it works very well for your patients with xerostomia. So um, Deborah, if you can tap on that red banner, it'll take you right to Jason's info or you can uh, send him a text message and he'll get back to you. Well, thank you so much, Jason, for being here. And thank you to IOTech. Thank and I want to thank everyone for being here this evening. We're going to go ahead and close out. You'll be redirected to complete the quiz and um, get your CE credit. If you have any questions, let us know. We'll also be sending out an email for you. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Hope to see you Friday afternoon for our next live CE. Bye now. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you, everyone.